me, I would say that most of even contemporary views about Creoles are still driven by the same racism that characterized slavery. And then they, they, they conclude, and I want to take that conclusion very seriously, that, that although we might use the label Creole, but that label doesn't mean that it's that we have a linguistic, a structural class of Creole languages. The term Creole is just a historical term that applies to this particular group of languages, um, but not isn't, isn't referred to special developmental or special structural patterns. You know, they're just they're just a, just a language. That's what the Creole is. Okay. Um, so, but then you know what we have to ask is you know where do we go from here? So we know of that, but then what was the issue there? Um, and w in fact, we can do one thing that, and this is from Mufuni's work. You know, so this is, this, I like this map, because what it shows is what we discussed earlier, right? The fact that if you really look at Creoles without biases, and you think of the development, and you go back in time, and you think of the development of, of Romance languages, right? So this is the way Romance evolved. So you had Latin conquerors going from Rome into Gaul, Iberia, Etc., and that's how the Romance languages were created by through conquest and, and contact of populations. And in the same way, if you look at you know what happened to French when French went to North America, the Caribbean, Africa, all the way to Asia, that's also how Creoles were created. You know, you got Haitian Creole, Mexican Creole, Mauritius Creole, Seychelles Creole, and, and this is where you get the Creolophonie. Right, um, alongside francophonie, of course. But the claim I've made so far is that you have similar patterns, not only in terms of language contact, but also in terms of structural development. Um, so from that perspective, again, there cannot be, there need not be this, this divide, this fundamental divide that linguists often draw between language change as in the history of French and then Creole formation as in the history of Asian Creole. You see, um, so I mean, we talk, earlier we talked about this, um, this myth uh, uh, about being into Creole. So now what we could ask is, um, and, and so now this is just, in case you want to you read more about it, so you can go to my website, and you, and you find lots and lots of arguments against this, um, this idea that you have this, this cycle, and then, but what we have to now, and, and here I'm going to be using some of the slides that I showed at the, at the UN uh, last week. So because what we want to ask, connecting to the issues of identity and education that were touched on uh, by Karen and, and Rachel is, you know, why do, why do these myths endure? And then, and actually, now this, I can go quickly, actually, because you've, you've, you've seen all of this before, right? But I just wanted to, to, to bring them back very quickly. But, you know, so now this is, again, this is, you find this myth in, you know, very well-read, popular newspapers, magazines like Newsweek, the New York Times, um, Reuters, even the New Yorker. You know, and all of these share that something in common that we saw earlier, right? Um, that now should be too familiar, which is you know, Creoles are French patois, broken French. You know, they're like primitive languages. This is uh, or. This one is the most poetic. Um, and I like this one because it makes me into a special specimen of, of humanity, right? Uh, because really, that's what it means, right? That means that, you know, as I like to say when I give this talk in public, when I, when I switch from speaking English to speaking Creole, I go from being a modern human to being a primitive human. <laughs> because I can, all of a sudden, on my tongue, you know, I get to pronounce these linguistic fossils which are the equivalent of the Galapagos to Darwin. I mean, this, is, this is spectacular. This is a spectacular claim, right? I mean, and this is Newsweek. You know, this is the New York Times. It, but it's, it's to show you how acceptable these claims are, right? But then, you know, again, to wrap up from what we discussed earlier, uh, this is in, very much in sync with, uh, with Michel Hof to you, right? Uh, now, this is going back to the early part of this, of this class. Which where we you know looking at history. So what, what we see is that the same way that Creoles have been silenced, the fact that Creoles are normal languages that has been silenced, is also the same way that um, Haitian history has been silenced for the same reason. Because how many of you before this class knew about Haitian history? Right? You because you have a Haitian boyfriend, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, but but most of us, you know, and when I ask that question, you know, even in my in big classes, like you know, 
24-900 with hundreds of students. I get maybe one or two people to know that the Asian Revolution was even more dramatic in terms of its claims than both the French and the American revolutions. You know, it was the only one in the, in the 18th century to proclaim liberty and equality for all, the only one. The French one, the French still had slaves. The American one, Jefferson, <laughs> Madison, all these guys, they still had slaves. <laughs> You know, Haiti was the only revolution where there was this claim for uh, liberty for all. But you know, this is from Trouillot that you know, as Haiti was entering history, you know, it was being written about by people who could not conceive of the Africans as equals to the Europeans, right? So, so according to Trouillot, those 18th century scholars, uh, and they could only read the news only with the ready-made lenses. And it meant that African liberation, the fact that an African army could win over Napoleon, they couldn't process that. You know, it was incompatible with the idea of a slave revolution. And the same way for language. So the same scholars looking at Haiti's revolution, they were also looking at, at Creole languages, and they couldn't imagine. For them, it was impossible that Creoles would be no more languages, right? So, so you can just pass on that. Um, so, the, so, the, so this is very familiar. Uh, so this is the root of all these myths. So the root of these myths is basically in the idea that um, the Africans were lesser, and whatever this, they, they could produce as language had to be lesser. Therefore, they could not be part of the same kind of um, theory as um, normal language change as the of French. So, but again, we can say you know it's the economists to be meaning that you know the, the, the driving. In fact, this is not clear. You know. I, I, so yesterday, actually, so Noam Chomsky was in, in Black Matters, and I asked him that question about, um, you know, what, what came first, the economy, you know, empire, or, or racism, right? Because one could say that racism is a result of empire. You know, if you want to create, if you want to make the Africans as beasts of labor in order to produce wealth, then you're going to demean, you know, the color, the culture, the language. Or is it, was this in there before, and therefore made it OK to make them into slaves? That's a, that's a hard question to answer. I mean, that's, that's, it's, it's hard to know. Maybe, maybe the two, as Chomsky puts it, the two kind of reinforce each other. You see, but in the case of Haiti, though, I mean, we have all these documents that show that, um, that, uh, that clearly there was this, one of the driving force behind the black code, which was a code that would, you know, to regulate the, 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 the slaves in, in the Caribbean, you know, the driving force behind it was e economics, right? Um, you know, something like that, right? So, uh, so the idea that you know the Creole blacks are superior because they are in the company of whites, you know, something like that. You know, so for all the tasks, is the Creole slaves that are preferred, and here the idea is that you know, the Creole slaves are those who are born in the Caribbean. Uh, they, are, they have African ancestry, but they were in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. and 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 they, they have more worth. Why? Because um, they are being uh, assimilated into European culture. We're talking about assimilation. So here, assimilation comes with a benefit. As you're being assimilated, you acquire. And, and actually, this guy this is the same guy actually who came up with this 128 parts of blood, right? You, you, you could compute qualities of, of different mixes based on uh, the quanta of blood, white blood versus black blood. He also had quanta in terms of uh, the worth of Creole slaves versus those of African slaves, a quarter more um, to, to imagine. Um, and then of course, you know, the idea that you know, what made them better is because they had been assimilated, or in this case, he used a poetic term, embellished that the domesticity, meaning slavery, by whites, would embellish the black species, right? Um, so this is some of the background behind all these claims about Creole languages. Um, but of course, the other part of the background that you know is the fact that um, there was this revolution that had to be silenced. This is the book that you read, uh, actually part of it that you read uh, about silencing the past. and, and so what I'm driving at here is that um, all this together you know, created the roots of um, these views that Creoles are special. And, and uh, again, just for good measure, I want to 
stress again, um, especially as, as we wrap up this course, that you know, this, these notions of Creoles being lesser and to be excluded, actually, they've been fought against even in the 19th century. So this is Dessalines, our first president. And now this is the, that famous quote in French, because it's written by a French observer. And but the key point here is the fact that Dessalines would get very upset when someone was, was back then, well, back, they, were, they weren't Haitian yet, because it was still under the colony. But he would tell uh, anyone who spoke French to him that, you know, why do you speak French? You have your own language. You know, so this is Creole, actually. You have your language. And as he was um, looking at them with disdain, why look for another language? Why look for someone else's language? So, so the point is that the Salin, even as he was technically a French citizen, as he was fighting for independence, he understood the power of the Creole language. Okay? And then now the, the, that same Salin, now this is um, to remind you this link between you know, politics and identity. Uh, you know, as he was, so this is one of the first 1805 uh, um, law in Haiti, creating Haiti, right? So this is Article 1, the people inhabiting the island, formerly Saint Domingue, agree to form themselves into a free state, sovereign and independent of any other power, right? So this was the, the, the most disturbing part about Haiti. Um, slavery is abolished. This was 1805, at a time when both Europe and the Americas, both North and South America, including countries like Colombia, Venezuela, Bolivia, who actually benefited from Haiti in terms of their own independence, they still had slaves. Um, so slavery is forever abolished. Um, but the part that, remember, is also important is that excluding whites from owning any piece of Haiti, which has now been changed. Um, but the, that, that part that I want to stress is the fact that they suddenly understood also the power of identity. Now, this is 1805, and he says that, you know, all uh, exception means difference of color um, will cease. The Haitians shall henceforth be known only by the definition of blacks. Okay, that's 1805. Okay. Was this written in English? Well, well, remember, so this was at the time when this was both in English and French. Because the Salin understood that he had to let the world know that this is my position. In fact, someone, so this book here addresses this question. So why, why, were, why was the Salin, since he was so pro-Creole, why was he writing in French and English? Right? And the point is that when he was speaking, like here, he was speaking in Creole. But he, when, when he had people write for him, because he, most, most of the time he had, he had people write for him, he wanted the world to understand what was his position about this issue, right? So he had to write in French and English because he was speaking to, not to Haitians, but he was speaking to the world. This is, this is our position, so beware. Um, but then, of course, you know, um, it's what, this, is, this is a book from a book by Paul Farmer. So this part is moving from 1805 to the present and then to understand why up to today there's still this struggle around language and identity in the Caribbean, you know, especially Haiti, is, is you have to start from the very beginning, uh, after independence, there were all this pressure, you know, for Haiti to remain under French dominion and under then American dominion. Uh, as you know, you know, America, the US, occupied Haiti for 15 years in the early part of the 20th century. But even in 1825, the French managed to extract this indemnity from Haiti for, you know, this, is, this was huge back then. I think this is now worth, you know, billions of dollars. Can anyone, can anyone read this uh, from here? Uh, who wants to read this? Okay, can President Boyer, for 150 million francs and the halving of customs charges for the French trade, all is indemnity for the losses of the plantation owners. These conditions accepted in 1825 led to decades of French domination of Haitian finance and had a catastrophic effect on the new nation's delicate economy. Despite its nominal independence, Haiti could not escape the shackles of foreign domination. The very fact of a debt to France strikes the modern observer as odd. 
Why might a country of former slaves feel compelled to remunerate the plantocracy for losses incurred in a war of liberation? Yeah. So, so basically, so the answer is that you know, the elite had to make this compromise. The elite wanted to be recognized by Europe and by, and by America. Okay? So, and, and so this struggle, so that question here points to this basic struggle in Haitian history, that from the very beginning, uh, the new elite that became the, the, leader of the, the leader of the country, they, in many ways, replicated what the French had done, you see. Um, so that, that's why we, so this is now after the earthquake. This is from the Boston Globe, right? Um, and this is a straight continuation of what Paul Farmer discussed in that previous quote. So who wants to read this? This spot here. Go ahead. <laughs> Go. The question now is whether the wealthy elite that controls the bulk of the economy will help rebuild Haiti and create a thriving middle class. 80% of Haitians live in poverty, while a handful of often light-skinned descendants of the French who ruled the country's coffee and sugar slave plantations until Haiti declared independence in 1804 and other groups control most of the world. Right, so, so basically you, you see the cleavage is still there, right? And this is, so this cleavage, and I think here what, you know, we can refer back to Karen and Rachel's presentation, uh, this cleavage between the elite and the masses also has this, um, this reflex, this linguistic reflex, where French is the language of power versus um, Creole being the language that's still struggling uh, to become a tool for, for liberation, right? So, so here, I think we have this um, tight connection, this tight nexus between language, power, and, and identity.